much. Um, hey everyone, second day of uh, CCC camp. Here on Plank Stage, we have our next talk right now coming up with uh, Raina. A, a huge applause for Raina, first of all, out of speaker. <laughs> Raina will talk about blockchain and what's currently meh, not so good, or what's maybe not so good in the future with blockchain. And yeah, so um, in the end, we will do a short Q&A. And I will come to you with this microphone, so you can. Um, so we have your question on the recording as well. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So, a a warm welcome and uh, have fun with Rainer. And yeah, blockchain and uh, proof of ignorance. Okay, hello everyone. I think now the slide will come up soon. That's the magic of technology, I guess. Um, yes, so this is one slide and it will stay like this. Uh, as I've mentioned in the program, uh, this will may have uh, some grains of a rant, so uh, you can listen to me and there's nothing to see there. Um, okay, so blockchain, proof of ignorance. Um, I chose the subtitle uh, title with liberty and justice for some. Uh, maybe you know uh, the book by Glenn Greenwald, I think from 2011, where he analyzed the US system, uh, where in the opposition to the Constitution, uh, where it says with liberty and justice for all, he said, well, the system is gamed, and it's gamed in a way that there's liberty and justice only for some. And I want to make the point that this is basically the same with blockchain. So first to me. Uh, my name is Reiner. Um, I'm a computer scientist researcher at the Weizmann Institute for the uh, Network Society. And I'm also here with FIF, uh, the Computer Professionals for Peace and Social Responsibility. We're over there in the village. And um, I've been talking about blockchain for more than two years now, and usually about the assumptions and uh, what problems should be solved with this or what problems uh, cannot be solved with that. Uh, if this talk is too witty or too cynical for you, I hope you excuse me. Uh, as I said, it's uh, supposed to be a rant. So what I'm talking about is, on an abstract level, a blockchain as an emancipatory and autonomy technology, which gives power back to the users, and um, um, especially because it's, uh, it's, it's supposed to take away the intermediaries. I think you all know about that. And I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that a lot of you have a very critical stance on blockchain right now, um, so probably my conclusion might not be new to you. Uh, but what, what I try to do is to give you a larger reasoning why, why this feeling you might have, uh, why those, why those um, insights you have from a te technical point of view um, are also valid from a, you could say, maybe more social science point of view. Um, and I will concentrate more on blockchain as emancipatory and less on the supply chain management things, although we can uh, it's only one hour, we can move this topic to the Q&A if you're interested in that, why well, I think that's not a good idea. So, um, this talk will have three parts. First, I want to talk about industrialization and division of labor. Then I want to talk about blockchain and uh, autonomy or emancipation uh, of, the, of the end user. And then I will close with some final thoughts and then we'll have the Q&A session. So first, I want to talk about industrialization and division of labor. Well, welcome. That's my Trojan. Now you have to, to, to listen to this. All. Okay. So let's talk about division of labor. Well, there has been the hunter-gatherer society, agricultural society, let's say maybe from 10,000 years ago, where people started staying in one place and, you know, the, the hunter-gatherer thing. There was no specialization in the way we're, that we know it now. Uh, certainly there were roles in those societies in the villages, but not in the sense of how we now in industrial societies we have like very specific tasks even maybe broken down to one part of the screw, which is not even the whole screw to, to make that for example. So the next step you could say is industrialization, uh, industrialization where you would say maybe you could s see the starting point in the mid of the 18th century, 1750s somehow, where some people would say uh, the start was the steam engine and such. This is usually the tech narrative. But um, in social science, there are also other voices who say uh, industrialization actually came about because of mainly a reorganization of labor. Totaro Nino, our writers that wrote about this. So that means 
you could have had industrialization without changing technology just because you reorganize and split up labor and then distribute it to different people. So it's, you know, that's just the other end, which would be a totally non-tech narrative. Um, well, of course, the truth is somewhere in between. It's usually intertwined. Uh, people create technology, then cr technology creates how people interact with each other and back and forth. So it's, it's, oh, it's as usually, I think, a mix. So, but what changed? Well, at first, uh, I want to look at the workplace. Uh, like uh, Riese somehow distinguished uh, three uh, dimensions where uh, work changed. First, we had standardization. So we could measure products. We could like uh, measure in the physical sense, but also in terms of quality. So we can say, if we know um, the products are standardized, then you can split this up into a chain, and then you can say, okay, I replace this part, or I use another part, because uh, uh, the interfaces are somehow uh, standardized. Then we have specialization. So the creation of products uh, has been broken up into small and smaller steps, from making the whole shoe into making the soles and the, you know, the top part and the laces and everything, so split it up. Um, to specialize and then have maybe higher quality and then, uh, you know. And the third one would be automation. So if you have the specialization, the standardization, you can actually start letting machines doing part of the work. Uh, in the case of the steam engine, it was the physical labor that was uh, being replaced. Um, now we could say maybe uh, now the, like the, the, the mental label is, uh, is being automated as well um, by the use of computers, but this is, not, this is not how it started somehow. So obviously society changed because of those kind of production methods. Um, well, the, with the specialization, the increased uh, in degree of details for each step. Uh, if you're a Marxian, you would say, oh, this is the start of the alienation of the worker. So if you're not really you know, building, uh, making the shoe and selling it to people, but you're just using the laces, you will never see the happy customer buying the shoe with the beautiful laces. So you're somehow alienated from this, the things you do and uh, not getting any social uh, feedback somehow. So, hence, society became more complex because, of course, uh, you have to organize this kind of labor and this kind of, you know, have the, the parts and then you reunify the parts again. You have to, so, so a special um, new class, like the bureaucrats were... Uh, created somehow, you know, the people with the ties who just only do the, the organization of labor. Um, and in the same way, uh, the products and artifacts also became more complex. Uh, if you look at it now, even shoes have this kind of, you know, the parts where the air is in and then the other parts where, you know, protects you from, from uh, rain and whatever. I, I, I'm not wearing shoes, so maybe that's okay. Um, so um, the alienation started from... Um, People from their products, but also people from each other and people with larger organizations where people work, where you don't even know really where's, like, who's the management and all this. So everything gets more and more complicated because of splitting up all the steps. So um, sociality somehow definitely changed from communities to society. What does that mean? Well, in the community, usually, you have individual exchanges between people who are seen as people. So you have... Your neighbor is not someone who provides a service to you, but it's your neighbor with their problems, with, you know, with a whole personality somehow. So this is somehow how villages somehow worked. And if you look around in camp as well, um, you have the villages where people know each other and where people, it's not really the exchange of products, but it's more like being there together as, as a group. Uh, but society... And the opposite is somehow uh, characterized, uh, if you want to follow Tony's on this, uh, by the functional exchange. So if you go to the bakery, um, you're actually not that much interested in you know, how the life is going of the person selling you the bread. Maybe there might even be just an, uh, an, uh, a machine doing this for you. So you're only interested in the functional service that person provides to you. So that's somehow... Someone made the shoe and gave it to someone else, and in the end, you just go to the shop, here's the money, I want to have the shoe. So the interactions somehow dehumanize and get very functional. So this is kind of the, the, the switch from community to society, as you would say. So that means um, you, now we have co a continuous exposure to uh, incomprehensible artifacts. They might be technical or not. It's the same with, if you think about... Uh, as I said, you don't even know, maybe, maybe usually you don't even know where your bread comes from. You know, if you go to an organic shop and they show you, you know, this is the bakery, you can even go there. But this is not really how 
at the moment society largely works. And all these complicated products, if you think about cars, computers, condoms, water, socks, food, in all of those products, we are, um, we are not experts. So we go to a shop and we buy something and somehow we have trust that it will not poison us, it will not you know, hurt us or anything like that. So, but also, um, what also came up as a change is um, more and more power differences. Because not all actors in the society game are equally powerful. Of course, the individual, if you're in a community, you, if there's a problem, of course, you can somehow deal with a problem or with the person you have a problem with or anything. And if, there's, if you can't solve it, maybe you go somehow one layer up, but you also know the, this person. So it's maybe the, the elderly person in the village or something, but you still know each other. But now with large organizations, if you have a problem, well, you get to the customer complaints and they all think our problems are really important to them and they will get to back to us as soon as possible. You know, you don't really, you don't really know what's happening. You're just interacting with the machine, if, uh, so to say. And of course, those large corporations, uh, might it be uh, BMW or Facebook, they are very, very powerful. They define how a Facebook profile looks like somehow, what, what you can choose, uh, um, how to present yourself, right? We had this, this problem with, um, let's say, gender. If Facebook says there are only two genders, well, this is what you, can, you could choose in your pull-down menu, right? The, you, you can't change what, how, uh, how, um, how a profile looks like. You can maybe fill in your famous movies or something, uh, but that's, that's, you know, that's, so the restructuring of society is uh, completely taken over by those um, organizations. It must, it's not necessary bad, but I'm just saying there is a difference. So, but how, how do we deal with the situation of those power indifferences and those largely not understood uh, systems and, and complex interactions and also the products we don't really understand? Well, there are basically um, two, two approaches. It's like two extremes on the scale. I would call the first one the libertarian approach and the second one is the collectivist approach. Well, the libertarian approach says I would like to call it the, vo the warrior mode. It's kind of, I have my individual responsibility and um, I want to have the power to live my life as I please. And if I want something, a product or something changed, then I have to learn about it and change it myself. That's kind of, maybe in this community it was, would be like, okay, there's surveillance and everything, so what do you do? Well, you encrypt your emails. This is what you can do. You acquire the knowledge about IT security, about data protection, all this, and then you start doing what you do. And this is kind of the, the, you could say, maybe crypto anarchist view, encrypt your stuff and your friend's stuff, and then you, you try to stay out of society. You somehow try to create an enclave where you, in your warrior mindset, can kind of fight society because it's not like you want it to be. The other approach is somehow the, I would call the collectivist approach. It's somehow, I would say, maybe in computer terms, protected mode. So we have some collective responsibility that the society is somehow shaped in a form that not everyone has to be a warrior all the time. So those power differences have to be somehow counterbalanced. What we made up for this is some kind of the idea or the most positive idea like a state where you say, okay, people pay taxes and then maybe the, the weaker ones of society, they get some kind of support. The stronger ones have to pay more taxes. It's an ideal world. I know it doesn't work like that. Um, but that's, that's, somehow, that's somehow the idea. So that there's an, a collective system in place that somehow balance, uh, balances again those natural imbalances. Um, so, if we have, um, if we have like those two modes of, of, of operation, now we can think about emancipation and autonomy. It's somehow autonomy, the opposite of heteronomy, which means like to be controlled by other people, but to, to take your life and to, to take your decisions into your own hands, to be able to do this. So, you want to live freely and independent, um, from coercion, but even from sickness somehow, right? Because we all have different health uh, prepositions. Of course, there's the part of how we live our lives, uh, but of course, there's the part of how we're born and, and all those things. So, in the first case, well, the first case, I mean, uh, the libertarian, um, if you want to live free, well, then you need the power and the resources uh, and some critics even say you need the luck. You know, some people are born with passports with more 
possibilities and other people just had bad luck with maybe even no passport. So, but this is something you have to deal with yourself, right? The libertarian approach. The second case, the, the collectivist approach, is somehow the group of people, the society, somehow has to come up with a solution that the society and the environment should somehow be prepared to somehow carry the, pol uh, the powerless and restrain the strong ones. Well, some critics say it's only about raising the powerless, but that doesn't really work because the, the means to distribute are somehow limited. So if you want to support the powerless, of course, you have to take power from someone. So it's, it's, you could even say it's a zero-sum game. So if some people say, well, the problem is not that there are so many poor people, the problem is that there are not enough rich people. Well, it's, with one, one amount of money, of course, you can't make other people rich without taking the money from somewhere. You know, it, it, it doesn't, it, it's connected. Um, so just an example uh, for this kind of the libertarian approach and the collectivist approach, if you think of uh, maybe you have the freedom of movement in a city with a lot of bridges. Like Berlin, for example. Berlin has more bridges than Venice, so let's take Berlin. So the libertarian approach, what would it be? It would be, well, you have to repair the bridges all the time, you have to learn how to swim, you, maybe you have to buy a boat, uh, maybe a big car that you can actually drive through uh, those areas where the bridges are broken, or maybe you have strong and important friends who somehow arrange things for you. Well, the collectivist approach would be, well, we have to make some organization, create organizations whose responsibility is to take care that those bridges are in good conditions. Because not everyone is a bridge maker, right? So the main target of, of this organization is that you can actually exercise your freedom for free, for free movement, which is based on the bridges being in a good condition. So that means just to say, well, you have the freedom of movement, the next question should be, but what are the preconditions? Well, if there's a lot of bridges, then the bridges have to be okay, otherwise this freedom will never be exercised or only be exercised by the powerful ones, right? So that's kind of the libertarian versus collectivist. So now let's talk about blockchain, finally. Especially when I say blockchain, I include smart contracts and the like. Um, what I will not talk about is permissioned or private blockchains, uh, because to be honest, um, I as a computer scientist, and probably as you somehow are as well, um, permissioned or private blockchains, of course, are databases um, um, somehow, but really, really slow and inefficient databases. Because of course, if you say, you know, we, have, we want to have a system where everyone can participate, and then you say, okay, let's have it uh, private or permissioned, Again, you have a power entity that decides who plays the game or who doesn't. So I don't want to talk about this. So I want to talk about the, the public immutable distributed ledger. That's the real thing. This is the only thing I would consider uh, a blockchain. So the promise here now is with blockchain, we want to have money without banks. We want to have consensus without notaries. We want to have a world without intermediaries. And we want to have a society without the need for trust. If you think back to what I said before, this would be the trust into an organization that that organization actually takes care of the bridges. We don't want to have those in between things. We want to have you know, only direct interactions. Um, exactly. So let's look, for example, at uh, Bitcoin and autonomy for this matter, but this can be used for, for a lot of uh, blockchain approaches somehow, but it's basically, I would say, the still the largest, maybe you can add uh, Ethereum as well, um, application um, of, of this public blockchain, which is actually in use. Well, the idea, and now I make this as a concrete example, but as I say, you can uh, make the abstract view about this yourself. Well, the idea is, well, people should have their own wallets and it's decentralized. There's no central entity who can meddle with, with the numbers or anything. And the idea is, well, mining is done by everyone. It's also decentralized. So that means in this, if this will work like that, of course, it's a good idea um, because then you, you, this, is, this is one approach to somehow decrease those power imbalances by just saying there are just no entities who have power. So the system should somehow reorganize itself because everything is centralized, uh, decentralized and stays like that. Well, but of course, if you look at the reality People use exchanges a lot. A lot of, you know, the majority of people uses exchanges and not have their own wallets. Um, 
because it's easier to tra trans, uh, transfer money and everything. But if you look at it, also in, in the somehow daily use, it's mainly the IT experts and the people who know what they're doing that are having their own wallets in their computers, in their uh, mobile phones. But everyone else actually uses exchanges. And the reality with the mining, well, it's done by some big players. If you, if you think of Bitmain, it's somehow around, depending on, your, on, your, uh, on the estimations, 60% of the hash power um, <clears throat> somehow. So the mining itself, it also became centralized because of financial incentives, because of other reasons. But we have, again, a centralized system because there was no... Um, uh, no like built-in system uh, to keep it decentralized somehow. Well, at least it is still public, right? So that was the, those were kind of the the, the promises. Um, but why are there those problems? Why why do people use exchanges? Well, obviously not everyone is an IT expert. Only those ex IT experts they can have wallets because if you have a wallet, what does it mean? Well, you have all your valuables on your computer. You have to understand when to update, you have to understand how to secure your machine, and all those things that are necessary around to actually make use of you being able to control the money yourself. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and um, if we look at the mining, for example, this is a, another point, so even, even if there would be 100 nodes and 90 nodes, um, uh, 100 nodes and the system would be technically decentralized, it could be that 90 nodes belong to one person. So at this point, you would have a technically decentralized system, but uh, the power analysis would show you that there is, again, uh, uh, again, there is a power center. And this cannot be prevented by the technology itself, of course. Right? So, this is the, that's, uh, so we somehow have a re-centralized world already using like, the most... Um, <clears throat> the most broadly used uh, uh, blockchain system. Um, I will not go into details, but could it be otherwise? And <clears throat> <clears throat> so let's pretend it would be otherwise. So people would, uh, would have their own wallets and, and everything like that. Well, look at some random cases. So you have an insecure computer, your money was stolen. Well, in the old world, in the banking system, well, if there's anything happening, you know, uh, like, like um, <clears throat> it's, it's not always the case, but if some of the banks go bankrupt, there is a system in place that someone says, okay, if one bank goes down, it will be supported by other banks. So the individuals, usually, that's the ideal world, will not use their money because there are mechanisms in, pl in place that support comes from other ways. So it's not, the, it's not about uh, the individual now having to suffer that some banks went down. I know, 2008 complicated. Okay. <clears throat> um, so sometimes even if you have a credit card fraud and whatever, usually there are some kind, ins kind of insurances in place and maybe it's a lot of paperwork, um, but at this point somehow you get back what you lost, usually. Or if you say, for example, you have made a drunk transfer. I don't know if it happened to you, you're at night, uh, maybe at, ho at home, you're drunk on eBay and suddenly you buy some big machine or something, you know. Uh, um, or maybe you mistyped a transfer, something like that. Or you were forced to do a certain transfer, you know, gun, gun on your head, that's the most obvious one, but maybe there are other reasons why you were forced to do this. Um, or maybe you ordered something and the, damaged, uh, and the goods delivered are actually damaged. So how, how, do, you, how do you like revert a transaction? Well, of course, it's, it's mutable. You can't revert it somehow. So in this case, in all those cases, what I just outlined, the money in this example is gone. So as, as I say again, the old intermediaries could somehow tap into the jurisdiction system and say, okay, maybe you were forced to do that, so that's why this thing has to be reverted. And so usually if judicial cases uh, come before court, then the whole context will be taken into account. Uh, if there has been a contract, the contract is an express of your will. So that means if there's a dispute, then before court, this has to be negotiated. Was it your will and whatever and whatever. If you have, for example, smart contracts, what counts is what the program said. It might not have been what you wanted, but this is what counts. Um, or maybe you have a pension, uh, a pension smart contract and you get uh, like in, I don't know, 50 years or so, you get all your money you saved and everything. Well, what, is, what if there's a bug in your smart contract? And I mean, we are all somehow closer or further away from programming. 
Um, sometimes I wonder why planes actually work, but you know, if there's something, if you want to write code that should still be working and valid in 50 years, good luck with that. <clears throat> Um, the same would happen if you say, let's, for example, insure a car and let's attach a smart contract. So if your car is damaged, then you get, to, you know, you get your money back um, automatically. Well, of course, the first thing the insurance would say is, well, how do we know that the car was actually damaged? Then you would say, well, but there were some sensors, and so this has been reported back into the blockchain. And they would say, yeah, but are the sensors actually okay? We don't trust you. Maybe it was yourself. So maybe can you add some more camera proof that it was not yourself hitting the car? You know? And suddenly you see it's not about, oh, there's a damage, and that's why I get the money back. It's about what happened, who did the damage, how, what's the whole context of it? Was it really an insurance case, or is it a case of fraud? But this is nothing in the scope of a blockchain that just saves what is. <clears throat> so, in all those aspects, what's up with the autonomy? It somehow seems <clears throat> that if you take all this into your hands and you secure your computer and you have everything around, it seems like you're pretty busy all day keeping this system up and running. So it's quite a busy thing to be autonomous, and of course it is, and I'm not saying one should not strive for it. I'm just saying we should reflect on the um, necessary preconditions to actually be autonomous. So I would say, <clears throat> uh, I would say how free and self-determined can a person be if you're constantly thinking about not being poisoned, not losing your money, not being hacked, not being you know, killed and whatever, all, all those things. Well it seems like quite a lot of regulation and intermediaries have to be around for us actually to be free and autonomous. And that's a pretty, pretty interesting thing. If you take the blockchain approach which says, well, let's get rid of everything around and then you can finally be free. And now it seems like, and of course I'm exaggerating a little bit, now it seems like all this regulation, and we can certainly discuss about this, is actually a precondition for being free. And we're, suddenly it's, it's totally the other way around then we're not talking about the individual that tries to be free all the time, but suddenly we're talking about bigger structures creating the preconditions. And we can do this in a democratic way and whatever we want to do this, but this is about societal negotiation, not about coding and not about hacking and not about IT security. It plays a role, but this is not the starting point. <clears throat> and again, I mentioned the examples. Uh, think of condoms, right? If, if you would have this kind of your, your responsibility for everything around you, well, right now, you go to a shop, you get, you get those, and you're pretty sure, well, according to all, all we know, you have a certain percentage of things work, well, but in this kind of blockchain thinking, you would say, well, there's a shelf, and you have all kinds of, and it's written on there, you know, this is kind of 60% safe, but it's cheaper, this is kind of 90%, but this is a little bit more expensive, and suddenly you see, wow, now suddenly you have to be a latex expert uh, and a rubber expert to, to see which one you should actually choose, well, and if you don't have such a big income, well, bad for you, then you have to buy the cheaper ones, right? So suddenly, you, in all those aspects you see how the environment somehow shapes how free you can actually be <clears throat> and it's the same with food with brakes with water you know it's the same with car and brakes I'm also not shaking my brakes all the time because there is there is a system in place that somehow says if your brakes do not meet this minimal standard you should not go to the road and this is not about myself because I can be sure that all the cars around me also had this check you know maybe you don't trust the drivers but if you're honest to yourself, you trust the drivers. If you're on the motorway or even if you're on the bus, if you would think things will go, on, go wrong regularly, you would not take the bus. So you have this kind of trust all the time everywhere. And now I find it pretty interesting to say, well, let's use some, um, let's apply some kind of technology that says, well, let's get rid of all the trust. If you look around you and maybe today what you will do all day, just make this example to say, what would I now do if I would not trust those people around me, how, um, how much effort it would be all the time to secure everything. And this, this would be, I, I would consider this a very unfree world. <clears throat> so what I'm just saying, and this is kind of maybe the, the, the extreme uh, thesis here we can discuss later on, without those safeguards, autonomy is not possible at all. And it's not possible in any meaningful way. At least not for the majority of people. Um, <clears throat> so that means uh, those blockchain individualization efforts are actually working against the autonomy of everyone who's not an IT expert. 
And this is, this is a pretty, pretty dim vision if you think about it. <clears throat> so that means those who don't happen to have IT as their hobby or their profession, well, you better not be old or weak or busy, have other strengths or anything to guard your values and live your life, right? That's kind of the thing. <clears throat> So what I'm saying somehow, or the, 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 the thesis I'm putting out here is somehow those kind of individualization efforts um, of the blockchain are actually somehow a rollback into medieval times where the most, the things you think about the most is how to secure yourself and how to be in this kind of warrior defending yourself mode all the time. <clears throat> and to make it more, more, like m more imaginative, uh, you could say this is kind of hiding your own money under your pillow and then thinking, okay, how, where should I hide that people don't find it? <clears throat> and I would just say this is neither freedom nor autonomy. So now we finally understand why, why it makes total sense for people to use exchanges. Because if their computer gets hacked, well, okay, it depends on did, did you store your password and everything, but somehow there is someone taking the job for you to deal with IT security, with all those measurements, to keeping the uh, software up to date, which maybe most of the time they don't, but that's a different problem. Um, but I think you see, you see uh, what I'm saying here. It's not that people are actually lazy to use exchanges. It is just a world that uses division of labor. And what I would say now is that all the talk of tech people about the autonomy by blockchain can only do this because everything else does not work like that. So everything else creates that much free space so they can walk around and say, hey, this, you know, spend your time uh, thinking about IT security, which I don't think uh, this should be a reasonable expectation for a whole society that includes everyone. <clears throat> so... What is uh, blockchain good for? Well, this is a kind of a funny thing. Um, I've been to many blockchain conferences and it's actually good as a business case. Well, you create a product and if you find a customer, well, that's good. It doesn't even say if it works, if it's a good solution or anything. This was kind of what I, what I noticed in those more financially oriented um, uh, blockchain conferences. If you look at the, like the top five examples for blockchain use, it, you could... You could solve all of that with a normal database, but blockchain is a new thing, so you can sell it. And uh, when I questioned people afterwards uh, in panels, what they said is, yeah, yeah, that's true. I don't, I don't care about the technology. If you call it something else, my task is to sell it. That's it. The, the use case is to sell it, to transfer money from the old intermediaries to us. You know, that's, that's, that's the idea. So that means if you find a paying customer, well, you succeeded. <clears throat> and maybe uh, you could also say it's some kind of um, esoteric thinking, uh, where it's psychologically interesting why people actually want to get rid of those intermediaries and, and be free. So this is more psychologically interesting. And I totally understand the need for that. But what, what we could say that, for example, Bitcoin, and this would be my interpretation, is not a call for you having wallets ourselves, but it's a call for the democratization of the banking system. And that's a whole, a whole different thing. <clears throat> and um, if we widen, if we like, look around what other use cases there are, uh, let's say um, <clears throat> um, supply chain management, to the, the, all those kind of, I can prove whatever, uh, you know, I, I can prove things to other people. Um, <clears throat> usually the examples where blockchain is being applied to or, or, or is, is wanted to be applied to, those are usually the societally hard questions. So if people propose to use blockchain for something, it doesn't say something about blockchain. It says something about the person, what that person thinks is the hardest problem, so that the magical blockchain will just save it for them. So um, as somehow Leon Kaiser phrased it, uh, you could see the blockchain as a Rorschach test. So you say, now we have this nice technology, what do you want to solve with that? And then it's interesting to hear what those people say to you, what they think their biggest problems are. Blockchain will not help, but now you maybe understand better what's, what's wrong in this organization. <clears throat> okay, and so just as a as a comment, maybe if we are now we're heading into into the discussion somehow. Um, if you want to have somehow supply chain management, and you say, oh, let's let's have a proof where everything came from. Well, who puts in the data in those um, in those blockchains? Well, of course, it's the suppliers. So the blockchain actually just records 
what they said would happen, you can still distrust them and say, well, you wrote wrong information in it. What the blockchain just saves is what they said. So again, you see, this is, this is not where it actually helps um, to apply this, because now you just have a very, very secure place to save allegations and not truth. Okay, and uh, maybe as a last example, I, he I, I heard... Um, uh, it's quite interesting if you look at a, a lot of um, situations where a blockchain is actually marketed to work, uh, then usually um, it's somehow the same as if you would say, well, we'd like to deconstruct this house. Let's drive against, against the walls with an SUV and eventually the building will collapse. It works, but this is not the technologically best solution. Okay. So now um, I think we are ready for Q&A and thanks a lot for listening. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Rainer. Thank you. Big applause, please. Yeah. Doesn't look like the blockchain will save us, the planet or the climate, does it? <laughs> not really, not really. Um, <clears throat> looks pretty grim. Okay, so we are ready for our Q&A. Um, um, if you have questions, I'm coming to you, so please wait when I'm here. So, Hi there, thanks uh, for the talk and uh, for, the, for the critical points. Um, I think, I mean, you're absolutely right um, with, uh, with your analyst, analysis. Uh, in one point, we do need to have these kind of organizations, structures, social contracts to safeguard us and in order to be able to really um, yeah, execute our liberties. But the point is what blockchain also uh, enables us is to organize these structures in a more democratic way. So if you say Bitcoin is the kind of democratization of the, of the banking system, in principle any DAO, so a decentralized autonomous organization, can be a democratic um, or transparent implementation of such a social organization, social contract that acts as one of these safeguards. So for example, you can build a decentralized exchange, you can like implement some future key, liquid democracy, voting things. And, and I think in, in, in your talk, in this kind of grim outlook, I, I feel you underestimated the possibilities of DAOs. I mean, they are only starting to get useful um, for the everyday user because, uh, well, mostly you have to be a tech expert to also participate. But this is actually changing at the moment right now. For example, the uh, day before yesterday, there was DAO Fest in Berlin and, and people talking about it. So I just wanted to also give that perspective and I wanted, if you, uh, wanted to ask if you could comment. Yes, sure. Um, yeah, that's actually a pretty good point. Um, the point here somehow is, uh, first, one maybe I, I expressed it in a wrong way. I'm not saying that um, Bitcoin is a democratization of the banking system. What I said is the Bitcoin in itself it is a criticism that once we democratize the banking system, we can get rid of this kind of things again somehow. And I think you're right. I mean, a lot of organizations somehow have... Um, um, listen to all those criticisms. There are still some die-hard fans of this kind of uh, ultra-liberalist approach. Um, but with the DAO, I mean, I would like to look into into the details of that. I mean, the last big um, DAO uh, uh, that failed crazily with you know with this kind of uh, with those bankruptcy and uh, taking out the funds. The interesting thing was that was because of a coding mistake. So what, what do you do? What kind of safeguards do you have if your immutability, if the things you wanted to do with the DAO was actually, you know, Weizmaum said the computer will always uh, uh, do what you told him, that, but that might not have been what you had in mind. And so this is, if you, but if you now say, let's create those DAOs, and they are fully autonomous, but there are ways of, um, to have interrupts and say, okay, let's revoke this transaction and do this again, or, you know, all those things, suddenly this is not what the blockchain promised, right? So this is, this is something, but I'm, 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 uh, I'm happily looking for, for other approaches. Um, and what I would say as an example, I would not say, you know, get away with this technology. Um, if you, for example, pay attention to Faircoin, where they said, okay, let's first create the social environment where, within which this kind of blockchain approach could actually work so you have 
social negotiation about the trans uh, about the uh, the um, the trading ratio you don't have proof of work but proof of proof of cooperation so those kind of nodes who will be next uh, uh, calculating this is done by social negotiation so this is something but this is not the pure the pure wisdom anymore um and also uh, there's maybe something i would like to add um what i think what we should not do is to throw this out the whole window because somehow many people who do not really understand what blockchain does and what it can and can't do but it seems like a lot of people now listen and want to change something so if we know okay that person heard blockchain maybe it means digitalization or something with computers well we can also use this wave and just say yeah yeah we apply something and this is called blockchain but it's not public immutable ledger but it's a different thing so this is something we can use and to somehow get away from this pure understanding and then get towards a solution that does not neglect that society needs trust but somehow um uh, takes this into account as well so this is yeah um, I'm also much more optimistic as the previous person who who talked. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so about the security problem, for mm -hmm. example, back in App Your Key, there are now on Ethereum and soon on Bitcoin uh, smart contract-based wallet where you don't have to backup keys, where you have recovery schemes. Mm -hmm. uh, so <coughs> this, um, how did you told it? Um, uh, regulators and mm -hmm. stuff in place, they will be over time, I hope, implemented in mm -hmm. as smart contracts and mm -hmm. ways to also to make them upgradable in a kind of safe way. So I'm still much more optimistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, thanks for the comment. I think there's one thing we have to think about. Um, if this is being done and implemented, we still I would still ask who decides how the show code should look like. What are the rules? What what is seemed to be a good solution for revoking or this kind of recovery scheme? I think there's a lot of politics involved in there, and this is if this is being done in a democratic way. I think I would, I would also see okay maybe there there is a way of actually improving something, but this is exactly the complexity that comes back in again to discuss about code. Who will be who has uh, read and write rights to the um, to the repositories and stuff like that? Okay, I'll allow a direct follow-up. Yeah, sure. So uh, the, the, the fact is that you can choose what uh, smart contract you are participating to. Mm -hmm. So there are different set of conditions mm -hmm. and you choose yourself which one you opt in. And mm -hmm. you can try mm -hmm. many. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, then I do the direct uh, interaction with the direct interaction. I think that's a good idea, but I guess the problem that has to be tackled then is how do, how do you make transparent what are the properties of those different schemes so that non-IT people would actually understand and are able to choose the right one for them. That's the classic problem with uh, investment or all this. I'm, I'm not saying it's unsolvable. I'm just saying then this is where the complexity uh, comes back in. And if, if, if there's a good for solution for that, I wouldn't say it's, it's not possible. I'm just saying it's much more difficult than like throwing out this, uh, the code and now you can choose and that's the solution to choose because choosing is like transparency you have to be able to understand what's being presented to you and then you can actually make a choice it's like it's like with those uh, uh, informed consent and data protection no one's inform is, is, is really informed about anything and but still we we say oh but it's your choice and now that you consented we can do everything you, we wrote in those 160 pages you know, this is, we have to think about what choice means. And this is, yeah, as a, as a basic um, thought for this. <clears throat> hey, thanks for your talk. Um, I think I disagree with most of the points you made. Cool. Uh, also, shameless plug, we will host a debate night tomorrow at the 402 Payment Required Village, which will probably cover similar topics. My question is, <laughs> if Bitcoin or systems like Bitcoin actually reduce the autonomy or are very hard to use, how come that more and more people around the world actually massively benefit from that? People who live in oppressive governments like Venezuela, Iran, China, people who just want to buy the medicine they need, or normal people who just want to save? Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that's actually a pretty good point. Um, but if you look at, I mean, in Venezuela, this cryptocurrency story was not really successful. I mean, they didn't use their own, but okay, anyway. But the point is, I guess the point is, at, uh, what I would say is, um, 
this might be a temporary fix for a, a totally different problem. Because if you look at this, people in oppressive regimes, of course, they spend their whole day resisting the oppressive regime. And so Bitcoin, like getting into this and trying to get medicine, I totally agree with you. But if the use case is um, that it works in oppressive regimes, then I would say this is a very narrow and a very justifiable use case, but I don't think it's a general theory of society to say it's, it's being used a lot in oppressive regimes, so it must be a good thing in a free society to use. So if, if this is part of your, of your fight to, for freedom, then I would totally agree, and I would also encourage people to use it for those reasons. Totally, yeah. <clears throat> well, just as a comment for, uh, like, Ultimately, with a, with a blockchain and with smart contracts on it, you have a way to transparently kind of enforce a social contract. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, like, let's keep bugs and stuff uh, aside and fail safes. Let's say this is, in, mm -hmm. to some extent, an engineering issue. Um, then you can use these blockchains to really enforce, uh, to enforce so social contracts. So then that, that means it's actually a possibility to go beyond oppressive regimes which offer a, some kind of social contracts to, let's say, to their citizens or some group like a Facebook to their users or whatever. And, uh, but this is a way to transparently enforce it. And with a perspective why everything is focused so much on DeFi, decentralized finance, well, mm. ultimately, we all have to agree that money is the largest social contract that we had at, have at the moment. Mm -hmm. And um, so, like... Just a final example, two months ago, uh, a DAO launched, uh, which is called the DX DAO, which um, basically governs a decentralized exchange protocol. And there, well, basically the DAO itself is on-chain, and the DAO itself has the key or the possibility to change the parameters of that uh, contract. And this is such a parameter change that needs to be like proposed, and on-chain people that uh, are part of the DAO can then change these um, parameters, okay? Now it's the question like the reputation holders or the people who can vote, how are these voting rights distributed? Exactly. But this you can also do in a kind of meritocratic uh, way by like some, okay, you have some initial set of, of, of people who somehow got the, are there in the first place, but their incentive is to kind of like distribute voting power to people who actually do things. So they're implementing a meritocracy. Mm -hmm. And so, so I, I think, I think there is possibilities, and I, th I think well, it's very worthwhile thinking about these things and 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 uh, like trying to let your mind uh, flow f flow free and not only taking the liberal uh, libertarian perspective. I think for taking the socialist perspective on blockchains and decentralized organizations, there's a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's one person agree. No, All and right. there was also no wait 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 there was. There was also um, there was also someone with a question up here front. Um, Where? Here, you. Yes, oh. exactly. And I want to answer on this. Um, if the idea is somehow to reflect and represent the democratic negotiation process within the whole system, that's yeah, no, that, that's that's an interesting approach. And if the, all those criticisms I mentioned are taken into account, I have nothing against that. Of course, I, I would say this is this this is then a good uh, a good way um, of like trying to tackle the problem. I'm just saying all the things I mentioned needs need to be taken into account. And I would be very curious to see if um, what I presented to formalize this and put this into code, if this is more or less complicated than actually, you know, thinking about society. This, but I would leave it open, definitely, yeah. Okay, yeah. All right, next question. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, what I already thought about it, for example, the, U uh, the European Central Bank um, just could print some euros and so on. And I think this could maybe be a problem if, for example, the government changes or, for example, um, someone is elected that does not care so much about the, um, <laughs> the money and so on and just brings out the money. Um, I think that that could be maybe a problem that, we, we, that the whole trust is, uh, is on the central bank 
for a certain currency and and I think that's a little bit problematic maybe for for future maybe it's okay for now because we live in a good society but um how um, can we guarantee that we we always have this good condition in our society because things can change yeah well of course I guess that's the main problem we can't guarantee that and that's the point I mean um in the same way, that, that's why I argued somehow that uh, Bitcoin is the, the call for democratization. I mean, the whole idea of the modern understanding of a state is somehow to limit centers of power, to discuss how powerful those entities should be to provide the services, but not more. Of course, we have to discuss where exactly this point is, but in the end, it doesn't matter if, if you have a group of uh, five coders who maintain uh, you know, the, the, the Bitcoin code or whether you have the central bankers who can decide on this. It's, it's just the same centralization of power we, do not, we have to prevent somehow. That's why I agree with you, but this is not a technical thing. So, yeah. I would also agree with a lot of criticism you had, uh, but I would uh, say the conclusion should be a different one. The sh conclusion should be challenged, accepted, and also like really what you said, like with this wave is going on now, there are so many extremely important experiments that are running. And if the whole thing explodes, shit on it, but it's all this what uh, we learned and all also this um, scientific approaches and, and like the shrapnel, if, if the rocket explodes, uh, let's take the shrapnel and let's take all the technology and, and gather the pieces, build something new. You know, like, I think there's good experiments running now. Mm -hmm. so, but we should also be careful. Uh, it's a sharp tool. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also like for, for regimes, uh, like w they have real problems. That's why they need the tools now. Mm -hmm. yeah. We might have this problem in the future and yeah. that might be a tool that is growing that we can use later on, you know, mm -hmm. just, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, then um, as a comment to this, I would, I'm totally happy and I'm always amazed with what kind of ideas people come up and I usually get this kind of, okay, but let's, let's try and imagine and let go and all this, I, I get this in conferences as, as, as comments uh, quite a lot. What I'm just saying is um, maybe start a little bit smaller than saying the whole society will work like this and everything will be rearranged. Uh, just to take into account that this technology comes into an existing world where all the systems that are there, they might not be good, but they have a history. There's a reason why a bank works like that. It might not be a good idea, but that was a reaction of previous systems, and that was a reaction to previous systems. So if you want to overhaul the whole system, I'm, I'm all up for world revolution. You know, it's, it's, it's a good idea, and if it needs blockchain, what, I'm, I'm in, that's fine. But what I'm just saying is... Um, we, or like the, the blockchain scene should not jump into those societal discussion and say, we know better. And, you know, you have been thinking about political theory for the last uh, 200, 2000, whatever years. And we know how the society should be reshaped. And let's have some experiments. You know, all this, I'm just saying, we should have those experiments, but maybe start a bit smaller than leaving people on the way who are maybe not that tech-savvy as we are. <clears throat> okay. All, All right. The this, yeah, I think this pretty much was it. Uh, thank you for, uh, for your uh, participation. Thanks for your questions. And again, a big applause for Rainer here on stage. <laughs>